All right, so we'll go ahead and go ahead and get started here. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm Tim Neighbors. I am a videographer. I have been doing video production for about 20 years now, and for the last 10 or so, so years, I've been specializing in theater videography and video production um, through my company, Invisible Harness. Uh, and also joining us today is Eric. Um, you want to say hi, Eric? Hey everybody, I'm Eric. Uh, I uh, am the marketing director at A Noise Within Theater in Pasadena here in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, before that, I was uh, the director of communications and new media at the Off-Broadway Theater Vineyard Theater, uh, Union Square in New York City. Uh, and then uh, I guess the thing that kind of brought me here is the fact that my first pr professional job in, in, in LA was working at a post-production house. We edited big national uh, commercials and music videos. And uh, that really, I, I worked there for four years and learned the ins and outs of like how to make, you know, broadcast quality uh, films and videos. Um, and then went on to uh, start the theater company with some friends of mine, uh, a company called Furious Theater Company. And since I was the only guy that knew how to use Photoshop, I became the marketing director and that led me on this path that brought me here. But then the whole way uh, along, I've, I've, I've always been using the, the video skills that I have to, to help market shows and, uh, and create content for, for the theater. Yeah. I was, I was thinking what a, what a perfect person to have talk on this subject. Cause Eric, not only he started a, he's, he's, he's not only is he the marketing director for a noise within theater right now and has been for years, but he also started a theater of his own, a theater company, a furious theater company. And uh, on top of that, he has this this pretty deep uh, background in the in video production. So um, what a perfect person to talk on this subject today. So thanks so much for joining us today, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And, and, and uh, you know, you've done such excellent uh, trailers and, and, and videos for us at uh, Noise Within that uh, uh, I think people are going to get a really great education from uh, from your insight. Uh, you know, the, the, we, we, did, we get raves about uh, about the video trailers that we have. People are always asking us, who does those things? So uh, yeah. kudos to you. Cool, thanks. Um, I'll have that 20 bucks for you later for saying that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, anyway, we'll jump right into it here. So the first slide here is on live streaming because one of the first questions you may encounter as you're trying to decide how to show your theater production online is whether or not you should live stream it or whether or not you should pre-record it, edit it together, finesse it, all that, and then stream it later. And there is a hybrid of the two, which we'll talk about. Um, but first, just looking at the pros and cons of live streaming. Pros, it's live, um, obviously, uh, and there's a lot of uh, benefits that come along with that, like being able to engage your audience in various different ways, and you can get really creative with that. But it also has kind of that sense of an event, you know, because it's it's live. But uh, a lot of times, as we'll discuss also, the viewers maybe don't really know too much of the difference. Or maybe they, you know, you can kind of create a hybrid um, of the two and, and kind of sneak it by as, as a live thing. So another plus to doing, uh, doing live streaming is that there's no post work necessary. Once the shoot is done, the work is done. And that's it. So you don't have to pay an editor to do um, all the post work that could go into finessing it and making it even better. Another perk of uh, doing live streaming, though, is that you can um, charge higher ticket prices um, for a live event because it's got a little bit more of that, you know, it's live thing. Yeah, I think the, the, on that last point there that that. Uh... I do think that you can create elements that make your production feel like a, it's a premium thing. And even if you have a, a long running uh, show that you're going to, to premiere, you know, if you're going to have something available for people to uh, watch on demand for, for a month or, or for a couple of weeks, or however long it's going to be, if you turn that first one into an event, even if there's just a little portion of it, that's a live element, uh, we found that, yeah, you can charge higher prices. You can do an opening night and, you know, like take a $20, take a ticket from being a $20 ticket to being, you know, like a $50 ticket just for that one night. So people can get inside and get one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with the actors, uh, either through a talk back or, uh, special performances. We've even, you know, we've even done, you know, we've had galas that we produced, 
uh, as, as live streaming events that w- we did those as hybrid. So they were pre-recorded elements of that, but, but live elements so that everybody felt like they were experiencing something that nobody else was experiencing. Um, yep. Um, and looking at some of the, uh, cons now of live streaming, although it, it is going to save you some money on in post-production, it may cost you a little bit more money on the production day, the shoot day, because you generally speaking need, uh, more, equipment and more crew to make it happen. You're going to have to run cables from your cameras to a, a, a video switcher and have that set up to do live streaming. Um, and it also is a lot more stressful. Um, I have uh, a few uh, mental scars myself from my years of doing uh, live streaming work. Um, things can go wrong and things do go wrong. And although things have gotten, the technology has gotten better, internet connections have gotten better over the years. So maybe it's not as scary as it used to be. It's still kind of scary when you've got uh, all these people that have paid to see a production and it's all reliant on an internet connection and all the other moving carts that are going on. You could lose a a feed from a camera in the middle of the thing or maybe someone's mic stops working or you have audio interference or or whatever. Any number of things can happen. So, and then the other thing is that live tends to look a little sloppier and uh, a lot of viewers maybe don't even know why that is and maybe they're not going to be so understanding they're just going to say well that it just looked you know kind of cheap the camera was shaking why was it shaking and they don't know that it was like well that's because they cut to the camera and the camera didn't know he was on and he started shaking his camera a little bit and and they couldn't fix that because they it was live so yeah it can be a little bit un- unforgiving yeah we've had uh, some experience with that we did some readings um, that, you know, we pitched them as readings and I, you know, like our audience is used to the fact that if you, uh, you, you know, if they come to a reading at our, at our theater, that it's not going to look like a full production on stage. But in the zoom world, we did, we got complaints from people saying that, you know, this, you know, actors got out of sync because of slow internet connections and, and, uh, and there were a couple of weird things and, and we got a lot of complaints from patrons. So, uh, it can really cut into your patron experience because you don't have the same amount of control over it as you do when you pre-record it there, you know, there's always things that can happen even in a, with a pre-recorded thing, but for the most part, you have the ability to, uh, you're controlling most of your variables when you record in advance. So now looking at the alternative to live, and that is shooting it in advance, editing it together, and then streaming it later. Some of the pros, and this is huge, um, it's easier to make it more engaging. If you have time to finesse the the edits and uh, do color correction and audio mixing, having a closer look at that stuff and and fine tuning things more. Um, And then on top of that, you can shoot, and this is a big deal, you can shoot pickups you can shoot um reshoot scenes where you've messed up if someone flubs a line or drops a glass off the table or something um you can just say hold on let's back it up and reshoot that scene and not knock the glass off the table this time um so uh that's that's a huge advantage um and it's going to in the end just end up with a a better looking production um it's less stressful Uh, overall, I think, because you don't have everything riding on that one production day. You have time to shoot it, mess up, fix it, shoot it again. Even if, worst case, everything just went horribly on the shoot day, you can can try to pull together a second shoot day and uh, maybe, I don't know, you're probably going to frown on this, Eric, but push back your your stream date or something um, if you needed to. Um, But yeah, those are worst case scenarios, but at least you have these options. Yeah, we have experienced those worst case scenarios. We were uh, we were doing a reading that we were going to, uh, you know, it was because of the way the equity contracts were designed. We had to record it, uh, uh, edit it and air it all in the same week. Um, and we happened to be doing the, the recording of it during, when, whenever we were having fires out here in L.A. And one of the actors, their power went out. So that whole day, like for 24 hours, they didn't have power and we weren't able to get them on the call. So what we ended up doing was just uh, recording all of the other actors uh, and then coming back the next day and just picking up the scenes that re- that, that that actor was in. And I was able to edit it together uh, after the fact. And we put together a, a piece that looked seamless to, to the regular the folks at home. Great. Another thing to think about if you're editing it 
and uh, streaming later is that you can do a little bit more with special effects and video overlays. Um, you can when you're you can't you can do some video overlays and whatnot with live, but it's just a lot more difficult and you're a little more limited in what you can do. So like for example, if you wanted to make it snow during a scene, um, you could probably do that live. But if you wanted to um, make it so that a magic wand had some, you know, some sparkles come off the end of it or whatever during a scene, doing it live would be very difficult. But if you're editing it, it's it's really easy actually to, to do that sort of thing. So uh, a lot more can be done with with special effects and video overlays if you're if you're shooting in advance. Yeah, my wife has been using that a lot. She's uh, she's working also with the noise within. Uh, I mean, she works with their education department and has directed a couple of Shakespeare productions uh, uh, for, to be aired that the, they use in schools to show kids the uh, production. And these are all done on Zoom. So you have the, the boxes, you know, that each actor is in an individual box and she uses, but, but she uses a different overlay in the background to signify when we change, when you change scenes so people know and, and can feel it better. So when you're, you know, when you're in the a fairy sequence in Midsummer Night's Dream, you have a nice fairy forest in the background and it kind of helps the audience like follow along what's going on, especially in something like Shakespeare that, that has a lot of different scene changes and a lot of, and, and, and they're also uh, double casting a lot of the roles. So it helps like, it helps them, uh, it, it helps people know where they are um, in, in, in the timeline. Um, some of the cons to uh, shooting in advance and then editing it together. Uh, would be that it's not live. I mean, obviously, um, but you can, as we mentioned, you know, make it appear live um, by having a certain date that it's going to air, and having you know even some live elements combined with it on the on the actual airing date. Um, and then also another con would be um, post work is is needed. Um, someone's going to have to spend that time to go in and do those finessings and and fixes. And it just takes a little bit more time, um, probably overall. Uh, but you know, time spent making your your production look better, I think, is time well spent. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, like a, a good a good thing that we've done is a is a yeah, it's a hybrid model that you talked about earlier. Um, and you just need you know if. It, you could have a whole performance that you you got all the actors together, you teched it in advance, you and then you uh, you ran that you ran it, recorded it, edited it all together. But if you put an int a live introduction from your artistic director before and after, uh, then then people feel like the feel like the whole thing is live, um, and you can even you know you know if you have the, if the actors are there. Just make sure that they're wearing the same thing that they were wearing, you know, or 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 uh, or or stuff like that, so that so that people, you know, if you don't if you don't want people to know that it's that it's not 100% live, there are are little things you can do, and, and I've even seen theaters uh, do things like uh, like there was a theater in town here, uh, Independent Shakespeare Company, that did a uh, Romeo and Juliet, and they went all out, sort of uh, using um software to sort of put people in different places on the screen it was all it was mostly zoom filmed but then they would cut away to these little live scenes uh that would like friar lawrence would be talking to the people or they had a commentator that would talk to people and they would use this, the score from the dodger game to help prove that it was live uh so mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of ways a lot of things you can play with to kind of so your audience uh feels like they're they're witnessing something you know uh in the moment mm -hmm. yeah I, and I, I should have mentioned um when shooting pickup shots you're gonna have to watch for continuity like they would when making a film um so if someone for example said a line as they were pulling their sword and then in the pickup they said the line and then drew the sword um there's there's could be a mismatch where you couldn't put a cut right maybe where you wanted to because there's these continuity issues to deal with. Um, and if you have a situation where there's music being played at the same time as someone's talking, you can end up with a situation where the music is, bleed is being picked up by the, the microphone that the actor is wearing. And maybe the music is not at the exact same point when that person's at the same, at this certain word that they're talking about. And so then in that pickup shot, you can't use it because 
you've got a shot of the person's mouth in this in frame and their lips don't sync up with the other take and then you've also now got this music that doesn't you know you can't edit it in so sometimes you can't use a pickup shot because that's going on so things to think about you know like you can try to isolate you know your sound guy may have tricks to try to isolate um sound sources from each other um so that the music doesn't get picked up as much by the microphone that the actor's wearing and so on pickups where you don't have a moving mouth in the frame um or where there's if you do have a moving mouth in the frame um maybe there's just no music being played at that time those ones are going to be a lot easier to use and more likely to end up being usable in the end uh, i'm going to show right now a little portion of a video that um, i actually shot this was shot pre-covid um with an audience it's of a, a production where what, what i did was i shot some footage of a rehearsal a dress rehearsal before the live production and so then i was able to edit in some shots into that live production that um are would be impossible to get if you weren't doing it that way so like for example having a gliding steady cam shot right up on stage um would be impossible because the the camera operator would be in the shot or they'd be on stage they'd be distracting the audience so anyway just something to to watch for as you watch this clip Yeah, this is just a really creative use of, uh, you know, just a great idea to, because I, you know, we've shot a lot, often shot things. I've often shot things that were, you know, uh, uh, from the dress rehearsal. Uh, and then I have separate footage for either a B-roll or for a three camera full run thing, but I've never thought to combine the two. Uh, and it really gives you so much more freedom. And, you know, this is a great, this video came out great. Thank you. So that video was shot with an audience. And so um, that presents some uh, some challenges and limitations that you wouldn't have if you had no audience. But there's also some some advantages to that. With an audience, um, you get that audience response, the the laughter, the the applause, and that um, it, it helps the actor's performance, particularly with co comedy, um, and it makes uh, comedies more they make it makes them funnier because you kind of have that laugh track going and you can add a laugh track in post but that's going to cost a little bit more um, because someone has to go through this thing and try to add in laugh sounds and, and make it sound real but also it's, it's a little difficult to to pull that off and have it believable um, you don't want it to sound like a cheesy little canned laughter every time there's a little joke and it's the same thing over and over or something yeah, I mean, uh, there's the obvious uh, budgetary constraints. So, you know, yeah. on the pro side, you already have a performance scheduled, you have crew called, you have actors called. So you you save uh, you save on those expenses if you're able to do it with an audience and if you're able to make it happen uh, with uh, with 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 people there and when on, on schedule. And, you know, you're also not biting into like if you if you have to do this during your rehearsal to, uh during your rehearsal portion uh you're not biting into rehearsal if you shoot with an audience um so you know 
as awesome as it is to shoot without an audience, uh, a lot of times I've ended up shooting with an audience because we just don't have uh, the, uh, the budget to call everybody for an additional day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there are definitely a lot of uh, negatives to shooting with an audience. It really restricts what the cameras can do and where you can position the cameras. Uh, being able to put cameras in their optimal positions, um, that's pretty huge. Um, rather than the usual thing with, with an audience where, you know, the cameras have to be way off on the side or way in the back of the room, um, that really limits uh, what the cameras can do. And you can get a longer lens and you know, zoom in more with the cameras to get those tights, but it makes it that much more difficult to have steady shots and smooth tracking of the subjects. Because when you zoom in, you're not only magnifying the image, you're magnifying camera shake, and uh, it makes it a little harder to be smooth with that stuff. In addition, camera movement, like the, the camera itself actually moving, um, I, I love that stuff. I use it a lot. Um, because I think that uh, when the camera's actually moving, it, it signals subconsciously messages to the viewer. Like, for example, when the camera's trucking in and not, I don't mean zooming in but actually the camera's moving towards the 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 subject it signals to the audience to the viewers um look closer we want to show you something something really important right here that you should be focusing on and when it when it pulls out and moves away from the subject it uh signals something like um uh, this is the the end of a chapter this is we're putting a period on this this profound scene that you're you're watching right now a dolly, a movement to the to the side. It adds dimension to the shot. It, it, instead of just this flat two dimensional shot, now you have this like this three dimensional feel that comes out. And I think it, it just kind of makes the overall production value a, a bit elevated. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of benefits that can be brought with the the tricks that have for decades been in the back pocket of filmmakers those can be brought to the table as well and i don't see why we shouldn't be also making use of, use of those for theater um, in our, our current state right now pickups with an audience um it's it's ideal to shoot your pickups i believe right after the the scene was done so you have less likelihood for continuity errors or lighting um, continuity issues I like the approach of shoot the scene, um, and then once the scene is done, you've shot it all multicam, then go in and get your pickup shots. And you, you can do it with just one camera. You might even have a camera on a gimbal up on stage getting these nice like gliding shots or maybe get the tight shot with the shallow depth of field. And for those that don't know shallow depth of field and what that means, um, it would be like you could get the focus on maybe someone's hand and have the background out of focus and that directs the viewer's eye which is really key it's all about like directing directing the viewer's eye to what you want them to look at and we have a lot of tricks that we can pull from with video that help with that so it's not it's not all left up to the actors and the blocking to try to get the audience and the lighting to get the audience to look at a thing now you've got cameras that can come to um, aid in that effort as well um, shooting with an audience creates distractions also. Uh, not only can the cameras distract the audience, but the uh, audience can be distracting in the video. You know, someone might cough, or a baby might cry at just the worst time, or maybe someone will stand up in front of a camera or bump a camera. So or that's I, I, thing. I've been recording and somebody opened a candy wrapper in the middle of the thing and it's just crinkling for, you know, for like two or three minutes because they're, they're they're thinking they're doing a better job by opening it slowly but really they're just ruining more minutes of my video <laughs> yeah really it's funny because i went to one of your shootings once and i was opening this candy wrapper and then i was thinking like this is probably <laughs> the worst time to open this thing right? yeah. no i'm just kidding um another thing to think about the crew the camera crew needs to be able to communicate with each other and if especially if there's a, it's a it's a bigger um, operation where there's like four or more cameras, the video director and there should be a video director in that scenario um, needs to be able to communicate with the cameras to say, camera one, can you get the tight shot? Camera two's already got the 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 two shot. 
and 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 so on, you know, so that they're not getting two sh two cameras aren't getting the same shot at the same time, which means one of them is basically not able to be used at that time. Um, the crew in a shoot like this needs to be able to work as a team. And in order to do that, when they can't see what each other is doing, they, they can't really do that so well. It's a little difficult to do that without communication. With an audience, you can do that communication, but it's like whispering, you know, and trying to be careful. The director of the play might also want to weigh in and say, oh, can we reshoot that and uh, um, get a, an angle that's like tighter on the person's face. Um, you can't do that sort of thing with, an, with a live audience. Um, I also put on here increased liability. Uh, with an audience, there's more chance that uh, someone's going to trip over a cable or a tripod leg. Um, there is insurance for that. Most um, production companies should have uh, liability coverage to cover that sort of thing. But it's, it's a consideration. Um, if you don't have an audience, you don't need to worry about that sort of thing. Uh, anything you wanted to add there, Eric? Yeah, um, you know, I've worked, it, it kind of depends on who you're working with, but I've worked with the theater directors who are very particular about, they don't want a camera to to uh, get in the way of anyone in the audience's experience, especially if you're in a smaller, more intimate theater, uh, you know, and, and if the director really cares about that stuff, then you have to be really far back or way out of the way, and, and the, you just have more freedom if you aren't shooting with an audience, but then in the pro side, uh, from, a, from an administrative perspective, uh, from an administrative mindset, you know, if you're shooting a performance that's already happening, you're not having to pay uh, everybody, cast and crew to shoot on a day that they weren't planning to, to be doing something, or you're not taking out a day of rehearsal to make that shoot happen as well. Oh, that's a really good point. So moving on to pros and cons of shooting without an audience. Um, a lot of pros here. Um, that being able to move cameras around is, is huge, being able to position them where you want. You might even want to consider if, if, if video is going to be a big part of how a, a production is released, you might even consider the camera positions in your um, blocking of where the, the actors are going to be. If you're shooting without an audience, you could lay down dolly track. As I know, A Noise Within did on their production. They just did this just yesterday. Um, you guys were working on that production. Um, yeah. We did our first. We did our first big three camera shoot with nobody in in the house, and it really did, you know, free us up to to, to take all kind of creative liberties. Uh, you know, we had all three cameras were on big sliding tracks, and uh, we were able to like get up on ladders and shoot from above, and and you know that that you you definitely couldn't do that with an audience. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to working with that footage too. Um, yeah, I didn't do editing for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yep, uh, so going down the pros list, um, another one is uh, lighting advantages. Um, lighting, when you don't have a live audience, you can position lights wherever you want. You don't have to worry, they don't have to be just up in the lighting grid. You can position a, a, a light up close to the subject, which means you could have a softer light, light source, like softbox, which is more a flattering light. If you're shooting uh, not live, um, you could also do things like bring in a light just for this one moment. Like maybe you want some crazy up light to hit someone and you could do it just for one little scene and then pull the light out. Less liability, uh, shooting without an audience and no distractions. We kind of covered that. Um, yeah. And then being able to shoot redos. I think that's kind of a, a huge thing. Cons of shooting without audience. Uh, yeah. You don't have that live audience response. So just a few multicam shooting tips, just kind of general stuff. If you have a video production where there's at least th like getting to where there's more than three cameras, you should probably have a dedicated video director there and video producer because, and it could be the same person, um, because you want to make sure that all the cameras uh, know what they're supposed to be shooting at what time. And then the producer is important because you need you need someone that knows which lenses to combine and making sure that all the cameras match each other and um, just kind of pulling together good shooters that know how to um, uh, work as a team and not just as a, a solo shooter. Um, so it's it's just, and that's also a, a reason to go with a, a video team as a 
opposed to trying to bring it in piecemeal, like hiring a, a, a videographer from here and a videographer over there and bringing them together and having them shoot together. Um, that can be uh, asking for trouble, I think. Um, because, yeah, with our, yeah. with our shoot, we hired a direct, we brought in our director of photography and then she just, she knew a lot of other people and brought on, she like filled out the crew. So, you know, she was able to bring in two other camera operators. She ran one camera and we had a first AC. So we were really, you know, and then, and then, um, it kind of left our director and I was working as a film consultant on there. We were up at, um, up in the balcony in a little video village. So we could just sit there and watch the video screens. And, you know, if something was out of focus, we could say, oh yeah, the, like we're, this moment, it looked, all the cameras were like not pointed at the right thing. Or, you know, there was a, there was like a moment where the, one of the actors drops a scarf and it falls to the, to the ground. And it's a, it's a big moment because the scarf signifies like, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be symbolic. It's actually supposed to be a baby in that moment. And, you know, um, um, but uh, so we, you want to see, we wanted to see that hit the ground, but we didn't see it hit the ground. Um, so we were able to just say, Hey, can we go back and, and grab that thing? Because, you know, uh, we were, we had a, we had a full setup and we had, you know, and it was our director of photography who made sure all of that stuff happened. We wouldn't have known how to build a video village without her. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, I mentioned on on this list here uh, the importance of getting a video village. Um, if you have a complex shoot with four more cameras, um, yeah, being able to let the uh, um, the play director be able to look over the shoulder of the video director um, is it, kind of huge because you don't want to get to post production and be like, oh, I didn't realize that they there was nobody shooting the the handkerchief that was dropping. Um, and then at that point, there's nothing really you can do. Um, so if you do have the budget, um, having a video village, and I don't know if we specified what, what a video village is. It's it's just a display in which you can see what all the cameras are seeing at, right in front of you. And it's it's good for what I just mentioned, but also the, the video director being able to tell the camera operators over comms which shots to get, when to pan left to zoom in, whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, using matching cameras is recommended. If you are gonna do this yourself, um, it it's not a total requirement, um, but camera manufacturers, cameras that are made by different manufacturers tend to have a little bit of a different look. Um, and it, it can be a bit of, a bit difficult to make them match in post. And if they don't match, it can be a little distracting, I think, to the viewers when you cut from one angle to the other and all of a sudden it looks a little bit more contrasty or um or a little more green or or whatever um so something there um never neglect audio i i'm kind of bouncing around the, the list here a little bit but um audio is so important you could have video that's not the greatest quality and i think people kind of might be able to hang with that but if your audio is bad it's really hard to be engaged um miking up the the actors is really the way to go if you can do it um, it's very difficult to get good audio during a play if they're not actually wearing the mic somewhere on their person um, there are ways that you can kind of try but uh, go ahead yeah I've, I've heard it said that uh like a good audio is 70 percent of getting a good picture in your in your film because <laughs> people will see it and they don't they don't realize they're like something's off this doesn't look good but it but the it turns out you if you just pump in better audio into this into the same into the same footage people suddenly think that it's a better quality film absolutely so if you do have it in the budget maybe getting a dedicated sound person um especially if, you, if you've got uh, a lot of actors involved um, you're probably going to need a dedicated sound person because they're going to have to run multiple mics, and uh, I won't go into all of that. Um, but just having someone there responsible to make sure that the, the, the audio is being recorded well, um, that's important. Um, I think we pretty much covered this list. Oh, I guess number six, if you are going to do it yourself, um, I definitely recommend getting some uh, a decent fluid head tripods. Uh, if you try to cut that corner and shoot on a cheap tripod um, without a fluid head, um, anywhere, any, anytime you're you're trying to track someone on stage, which you're gonna probably want to do if you're shooting with more than two cameras, 
it's going to fight against you and basically prevent you from having a smooth moves and then that draws attention to the camera movement and yeah just don't do it you can rent this equipment for really not as much as you might think um renting tripods uh i don't know you could probably rent a decent tripod for under 100 bucks um for the day um at Maybe for your wide lock off, you could have it on something cheap, but for the, anything that where you're trying to track with them, you should have a good fluid head. Yeah, when I first discovered renting equipment, it was a big game changer for me because you know it was not that expensive. You know, if you, if you want to get a good mic, you, you can you can rent usually you can rent mics for like thirty forty bucks uh, a day. Uh, you can rent lenses for you know I, I rented a lens this uh, this weekend for some to shoot behind the scenes stuff and it was only like forty five bucks so it's it, it's sort of a game changer you don't have to invest fully in like buying these things you can just have them uh, you know you can just rent them and buy them as as you have the budget for it so moving on um, picking the right video team for your project. Um, I have a few notes here, but ultimately it, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, if you're trying to turn your play into a short film, then you should probably have a filmmaker come and do the job. But um, if you're trying to do a multicam shoot, don't assume that a filmmaker knows how to do that. Um, it's a kind of a different field. So ideally for what I think we're trying to do or what like at least what uh, Annoys Within was just trying to do, um, you should have someone that knows multicam production, but then also if you're going to be going in and capturing those pickups, um, having someone that has that eye of a filmmaker and um, knows how to get those angles and ha has that eye for art, the art of it, um, that's a major plus. And then having someone that knows theater videography and has experience working in and around theater, um, that's a big plus too. Um, any regular videographer coming in that hasn't done theater before they're probably going to be a little bit fish out of water um they don't know how to maybe interface with the the, the theater director um or maybe they don't they don't understand how lighting cues work or what's an acceptable way to move around where they can and can't go during the play maybe they don't know that they can't move a prop you know like i don't know um but anyway, that's it's a big plus to find someone that has that experience as well. Yeah, when we were doing our search, we wanted we made sure that the person had at least some live experience. She didn't actually didn't have uh, theater experience, but she had uh, experience in in, in shooting uh, live productions. Um, so it, it really helped because she knew she knew that world. And then um, you know, and then I would I would also add that you know as you're looking for somebody. You know, make sure you're meeting with them and, you know, meet with multiple people because you find that meeting with multiple people, you'll find a, which ones you have chemistry with and which ones you don't. And it was really, you know, it worked out. We were able to realize in our interviews that, you know, we really have chemistry with this DP um, and uh, that that chemistry stayed throughout the whole shoot and made it, you know, made it a pleasure to, to work on. Yeah, that's a really good point. I didn't include that on the slide, um, but maybe I should have. Um... I'm always amazed at how people often hire a video videographer, a video producer, whatever, without looking at their work first. And so I always say, look at their work, make sure that they're doing the type of work that you're trying to do and they're doing it well. Um, don't be wowed by a really cool shot they got on a movie set or something. Um, make sure that it's the type of work that you're trying to do. But then also to your point, um, it's good to also interview them and know that um, that you feel comfortable with this person, that there's someone that is not going to be difficult to work with. And then on number three there, I have always work with professionals. Um, I, I think that quality just matters. And as I think we mentioned, it reflects on your organization, um, particularly with stuff where people are paying to, to see it. You want to put your best foot forward. And if you're trying to have that reputation as a quality theater, um, you should probably um, make sure that your videography is going to reflect that as well. But I guess I'm speaking to the choir probably because everybody's here because they wanted to learn how to make their films more captivating. So um, if you don't um, have the budget to, to bring in a professional, um, try to get a, as high quality equipment as you can possibly get, because it, it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, every, every time I uh, have gotten a new theater job, I've, uh, 
figured out a way to get a high quality camera for, for that theater. Like, you know, when I was at, at the vineyard and uh, I, um, they were, they got a big $25,000 grant to redo the website. And I was like, Hey, 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 before we do this, let's, let's, you know, take like a $5,000 of the budget and make sure we get a really good camera with fluid head tripod and, and all this stuff so that we had, we had a good setup to be able to create video content for that website. And we put that in the proposal for the website and, and ended up in getting the grant to make, to make, a, to make the, to make the website and, and, uh, and also uh, great films for, for, for years to come or great little videos or whatever. Yeah, it's such a good investment. You know, just just front that cash up front, get the get a camera that's decent quality, um, and then yeah, like you say, for years and years to come, all your content going online looks better. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right, and just some final thoughts um, before we open it up to questions. And, and by the way, I forgot to mention there there should be a Q&A spot there in your Zoom window where you can type questions and we'll just get to them um, in, in just a minute. Um, I think you can also ha raise your hand when we get into questions too, but uh, I don't think I'll see you right now. <laughs> um, so just a, a few thoughts. And a lot of this is just review, um, what we've already talked about. But uh, one thing to add is that you should let your videographers preview the show that can require um, a little bit more payment because that's going to be the, require their time. Um, it also would be good if, if, if you have the luxury of having them set up earlier and leave their gear there or however they want to do it, um, to be able to actually look through the lens and, and see what angles are going to look good and what things they might want to watch out for. Stuff like projections. I didn't even put that in here, but you might want to um, have them look through the camera and make sure that the any projections that are happening are not going to be having any flicker in camera. Um, the camera has to be set to a certain shutter speed that matches the refresh rate of the, the projection so that doesn't happen. But it's something that's good to know ahead of time and not something you, you want to find out on the day of, especially with a live audience here. Uh, but definitely good to let them have a preview of the show too so they kind of know what to expect and how the blocking is and, and where best to position their cameras. This is a kind of a, an obvious one, probably, but more cameras makes for a more engaging experience. I think we've all sat through a production where there was just one angle or maybe two angles, and it's, it's really hard to stay engaged with something like that, especially if there's bad audio. Um, but now we're kind of competing with Netflix a little bit, so um, we might want to up the game if we can um, and see the value in bringing in more cameras. It's obviously going to um, up the production cost, but if you want it to be engaging, that's a bullet you'll have to bite, I, I suppose. Having those different angles, um, it, it breaks the monotony, and also it directs the viewer's eye, which is kind of a, an advantage we have on, on film that you don't have in live theater as much, um, is that we have this new tool to direct the viewer's eye to look at what we want them, want them to look at. Um, so not only you know like being able to cut in for that tight shot, on the letter that we want people to look at at that moment. But um, also you can do things like if you're doing a pickup, you could have a shallow depth of field where the background's out of focus and the thing you want the subject to focus on is in focus. Different ways to control the viewer's eye. And then that camera movement that I talked about, adding interest and also directing you know, the, the viewer to subconsciously look closer or put a close on this chapter or whatever it is. Um, all of these things, camera movement and the framing, if someone knows how to frame well and knows how to kind of speak through their framing, um, that can add to your production. Since we're disadvantaged in other ways right now, uh, uh, live, theaters, live theaters are, you might as well pull from the advantages that we do have um, that we can pull from with video. Um, softer lighting is possible, uh, special effects, we kind of went through all of that sound sweetening. I mean, you can do a lot of your sound effects live. I mean, uh, theaters do it all the time, right? But you may, if you're just doing it for the cameras, you may opt to say, well, let's, let's not do the sound live. Let's just add it in later. So then there's no issue of continuity. If you have uh, sound bleeding into someone's dialogue and you wanted to use a take, but the, you know, like the sound was bleeding from something else. It was a, a sound effect that was played you may opt to just 
do sound effects in post and then you can really dial in have them land at just the right time you know, dial in your timing uh, and then of course with mixing audio sweetening audio you might say hey you know like let's add some bird chirping here we didn't even think about that before you have a little bit of extra time and now maybe you have a little more inspiration as you're watching your film um, being cut together uh, I mentioned on this list, uh, number four, um, that there is the potential that there's this video can have a life beyond what you're doing. Um, one of the uh, plays that I directed, um, actually just pre-COVID, um, Broadway.com is in talks and thinking about using, um, thinking about licensing that uh, video. A lot of these outlets are starving for content. So it does kind of present a situation where you know, um, maybe if it's shot really well, you're, and it's an original piece, um, so you don't have uh, uh, licensing issues yourself to deal with. It can, it could be licensed um, for um, distribution elsewhere. This is particularly, uh, particularly good for people who are producing new works, and you know, because a lot of if you're producing, you know, we're doing an Iliad, and it, we we actually have a lot of licensing restrictions on that. We can't, we actually can't advertise outside of a 50 mile radius. You know, people find out about it outside of 50 mile radius. That's fine, but we can't, we can't, um, we can't be sending our ads further than that. So, uh, but if you're, if you have a, a new playwright and, and, and new uh, material, or you know, even a playwright that's been around for a while, but it's new material and they don't have um, strict licensing con uh, controls uh, to start with, then then you can you, you can find ways to do stuff like this and uh, and, and get more get seen by more people and and even license yeah absolutely um you can also use this footage for other purposes yourself um to make trailers to promote the event the, the play um and you can also use it uh later for promotional videos for your your theater company gala videos whatever you want to do with it so um just notice noting a little bit of extra value that's being brought by the video production um, other than the immediate uh, benefits. Um, and then someone had asked in a, a, a Facebook forum um, for me to talk a little bit about um, tools to use for live streaming. Um, if you are looking to do it yourself and you want to live stream, you might want to check out StreamYard.com. It's a really user-friendly tool. Not super capable, but um, it, it does the job. It allows you to um, pull from, I think, six different zoom feeds correct me if i'm wrong on that eric well you can you can uh display you can display six people at a time but you can have up to 10 people i think including people in the waiting room mm. uh so it's really uh we we've used this for we've done um uh these we started these fridays at five discussions where we were doing uh discussions uh, about the plays that we've done with like talking with the creative the creatives involved or the actors involved or or just having you know, more intimate chats and we've been able to control those nicely. And, you know, we can, you can show videos in the middle of the stream. You can um, uh, share photos and stuff like that. So it's been, it's, it's a cool little tool as long as you don't have more than six people that you need to have on screen at once. <laughs> yeah. And if you do, and you want to go a little bit more um, elaborate with you want more capabilities, then you could look into OBS uh, switching software um, OBS has been around for a while and it's, uh, I think very user friendly, but also a lot more sophisticated. You can do a lot more with it. You can have people in boxes and resize them and have different feeds from a lot different, a lot, lot more different sources. Um, and you can stream right from that software. And, and did I mention it's free? It's like a freeware, um, and, uh, quite capable. You may have to get a little extra hardware to um, take in from different sources, depending on what you're trying to do, but that's definitely a tool to, to consider. Yeah, it's a it it does it does a whole lot of stuff. Um, they, it it does have they, they, it does have some limitations. A lot of times, if the if if uh, you know if you're recording an actor or um, a speaker or something that it they don't have a fast enough connection, sometimes you can have sync issues and stuff like that. But we've uh, we've ended up. For a lot of the stuff we've been doing lately, we brought on a, uh, a Zoom OBS engineer who uh, has, you know, he runs it out of his house. He is actually, he's actually lives in New York and he runs it out of his place in New York because he's got 
high, super high bandwidth. And he can also fix problems like if there are sync issues um, where the, you know, people's mouths aren't lining up with the audio that's coming out. He can, he can tweak and fix that stuff uh, mm-hmm. make, and make sure that, uh, you know, we're getting the best quality that we can get. And then we can build, you know, it, it's helpful too, because he's, he's great with cues and stuff. So we can build in cues to the, to the shows. If we're, if we're trying to record a, uh, a show via, you know, the zoom style boxes on screen. Well, um, that's pretty much concludes the presentation. Um, here's our contact info. And I wanted to extend the um, offer to anyone, at least the first five people who contact me, um, I will give you a free 30 minute consult. So if you want to brainstorm, um, I will do what I can to, to try to help um, advise on different ways you could tackle any of your video challenges. Um, I'm Tim Neighbors, so I'm the contact info on the left there. We have one question, it looks like. Can you talk a little about the pros and cons of camera phones? Sure. Um, Camera phones have gotten pretty impressive. Um, Definitely no shortage of resolution with those, so the clarity is is very good. You can shoot 4K on phones. The uh, disadvantages, one, is you're you're not going to want to record for a very long duration on a cell phone. Um, I think you're probably going to run into some problems there. And... uh, um, also, lenses is, is a big difference. Um, these uh, little uh, cell phones, um, you know, they don't have much of a lens on there. So, uh, a lot of a lot of different advantages. And being able to zoom, I mean, you're you're not going to want to use digital zoom. Some of these have different lenses built on, so they are getting a little bit better. But it's not to compare with having a big professional lens that gives you a longer uh, range zoom range without degrading the picture because if you do a digital zoom you're you're zooming in on pixels and that's not good um and and then just the low light capabilities um if you have a larger sensor like a camera that has a larger sensor tends to be um better in low light so you may find your cell phone videos getting um a little bit grainy in low light they are getting better at that too the technology is just getting better and better um but yeah for i think for shooting highlights you could use your phone. Um, uh, you could even get a little gimbal to um, have your use on your phone to, to capture B-roll, behind the scenes stuff, um, stuff for your education programs, um, and then maybe trailer stuff. You could do something like that, um, but you're not going to have um, all these other advantages that you get with a professional camera. Yeah, unless you can get up really close, unless you know, unless you're all practically able to get up on stage with the actors it's gonna you know that after you know after like four or five feet you know if you get if you're 10 if you're if 10 feet or more away it's really gonna i mean it's gonna be noticeable that you're not doing it on you know you don't have like a professional setup because you're just getting this like wide shot um but i think if you get in close if you can get in close you can you can come up with some cool ways to get some good footage yeah um, so we got another question from Ashley. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ashley. Um, how much would you charge to hire a three camera crew to produce a filmed version of your play? Oh man, go ahead, Eric. <laughs> no, it's it that 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 uh question is it kind of depends on the scope of it, you know, like because we've done uh, you know, we've we have we've worked with Tim a lot and Tim's excellent we love we love working with them and we always get compliments about how awesome our trailers look um but but he also has he has various you know when we work with him specifically he's got like a his art like he, he has an archive when he sends an archive shooter out it doesn't cost us nearly as much so you i, I think it's an individual thing you gotta you take advantage of tim's 30 minute uh, consultation and he can get you can get into the specifics with him and he can uh, probably tell you how much it'll how much it'll cost if you can if you can like work out the specifics yeah there's a lot of different moving parts um with any type of video production like what what quality of gear are we bringing in are we going to bring in other tools like you know we're going to lay down dolly track which you can do by the way if you like uh eric and, and noise within just did it this last weekend um laying down dolly track in front of the stage so that they can have some moving shots if you don't have an audience and you're shooting pre-recorded you can do that kind of thing but um but yeah how much equipment you're pulling in how high of quality equipment 
um, and then how good is are the um, the crew that are coming in? Um, if you want to to keep it cheap, you can you can have students come shoot your thing, and it'll be really cheap. There's there's also a, a lot of costs that you don't think about when you're when you have a big shoot. Um, so it is it's always helpful to have somebody who has some experience with it. Um, whether, you know, whether it's just a video producer or, you know, cause there were, there, there, there was, there were certain elements that are, I, I was, uh, you know, serving as a film consultant on our shoot this weekend because there were certain things that the DP is just concerned with like getting the best shot that they can get, but not thinking about little things like, Oh, we gotta, we gotta have, uh, hard drives to get the information, to get the video files to the editor or you know oh we got to rent a u-haul in order to get all that equipment over so little costs to start building up and if you're not thinking through the whole thing uh then uh if or if you don't have somebody who who has experience with it and can think through all of those elements you might get dinged with a with a higher budget here you know little dings here and there and suddenly you're like you're way out of your budget so if you have a uh, a rushed turnaround that's another thing to consider um, if you want someone to have to work long nights to to meet some deadline, they they you might expect to pay a little bit more there too. So just so many different considerations when setting the price. Um, but uh, but that that's a great question though. Still, um, I just wish I could give you like a a better, more direct answer, um, Ashley. Um, let's see. Allison uh, asks, "Hi, what uh, app systems would you recommend for multicam theatrical shoots?" with and without an audience um do you have any thoughts on that eric um there is a system i i think it's by black magic that i know that there's a theater in oh. um in uh Fayette, fayetteville theater squared in fayetteville they, they they built out a whole um uh live production uh so they can they can like record their productions live um is it the atem the atem atem uh, is a switcher that's um uh from black magic that's that's pretty popular and relatively inexpensive really really inexpensive compared to what we used to have to pay yeah um, and i used to use a tricaster a lot so just to throw another name out there i, I think i'm understanding what you're asking the systems yeah that were, that are used for live switching um yeah they have the, this this theater actually has a plan uh theater squared and you, you know you might reach out to them because i don't know all the, the specs on it i don't have those off off the top of my head but they they built a system so that they could film during covid they could have live performances with people in the audience but for people who didn't feel comfortable in the audience they could live stream each night's production using this setup that they got so they got and they got a they got a grant from the city to help them to help them pay for that uh, but i think they said it was like it was like a twenty thousand dollar setup that they got put in to to be able to do it but they're, they're able to you know now they have it they're able to do it for uh you know forever now mm -hmm. the tricaster has everything you would need they have built in live stream capabilities and they have different size units for the whatever your needs are. They do tend to be a bit more expensive than like the Atom um, from Black Magic. And I know someone that has an Atom, and um, I think he says it works well for him. I haven't personally used one of those, um, but the I, I think you just need to combine a monitor together with an Atom, and you'd be off and running. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, sufficiently. Here's a question from Jason Weed. Uh, most of our actors are stage actors and have never done film or TV. Any coaching hints, tips for directors? I think it kind of depends on what you know, what you're trying to accomplish. So if you if if you're straight, if you know that you're you know that you know if your audience is supposed to you know is supposed to feel like it's a theater production, I think you know the acting can be close to uh you, you know it can be close to like what they would do on stage but i think some of it is just about a lot of it is about looking at how it looks on on screen and and um some of it is just about like backing off don't feel like you have to project to the back of the house because you got a mic you know 
hopefully you have a you have a good mic and it's really close to you either on your lapel or or, or close enough um so sort of d don't worry about projecting to the back of the house just worry about you know finding the emotion in the moment i would say yeah that's answered better than i could have answered it so so there you go um let's see looks like uh, we might have one more question here uh for a show trailer sizzle or sizzle um to promote either a live show or stream what do you find is the best length of time man we st we used to do one minute trailers for a noise within people liked the trailers whether they were a minute or half a minute long but but it's also about um usage because um if you have a if you have a digital advertising company that can that can help you get your your videos out we we move to prioritizing 15 and 30 seconds because they get a lot more placement on like youtube or or you know if uh, if you're on a news website that that shows uh video advertisements and you have a and you have a digital advertising agency that can get you placement on on those sites um it's much better to have a, a 15 or a 30 second but i think if you can afford the extra you know the extra wow you know the big long trailer the wow trailer uh then i think a you know a minute is good but you know it, it, when when you're feeding them to digital when you're feeding them to to, to uh digital outlets the the timing has to be exact so it has to be exactly 15 seconds or exactly 30 seconds or exactly a minute whereas you know if you're just creating a a long uh trailer for 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 your audience at, uh, to watch on on facebook it can be whatever whatever length you want but we usually aim for you know uh around around max you know max out at around minute 15 um and and then have shorter versions that we can use for various various other places all right well i don't see any other questions um so i guess we can end it here um if anyone thinks of anything that you want to ask um feel free to email me uh, my email is tim at invisibleharness.com um, I'll go ahead and throw up the uh, slide again so you have our contact info. Um, and there you go. Um, so anyway, thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, hopefully this is the first of maybe maybe future webinars. Uh, if there is anything you want to have discussed at a future webinar, um, please just like uh, let me know, email me, message me, call me, whatever. And uh, I'll try to put something together. All right, guys. Thanks a lot, and thanks, thanks, Eric, for yeah, taking. Yeah, and I'm happy. You know, if you, if anybody has any questions that they think, uh, you know, that they want to shoot my way, I'm happy to uh, to help too. All right. Thanks so much. Bye bye.